Hello and welcome back to New Beginnings Church Online. And we're so glad you decided to join us tonight. Have you ever asked, where is God? Or who really is God? Does he still do things today? Uh, and, and the question, the answer to that is, yes, he does. And we're starting a brand new series today called He Is. Because you see, God is not the God of the past or the God of the future, but he's the God of now. God wants to be active in your life today. He wants to show you all that he wants to do for you. And over the next eight weeks, we're going to look at who God is in all 66 books of the Bible. Kind of like a vacation Bible school for adults. You're going to enjoy this series and see all that God wants to do for you now because he loves you so very much. So sit back and enjoy the message tonight. Hey, so I'm here to talk with Pastor Devin about some VBS things we've got coming up. You can come on and join me. All right, so let's just, let's see if anyone's here. Hello? Pastor Devin? Hmm. I where he is. Yes. Is anyone here? All right, Pastor Devin generously donated $15 for our snacks and our drinks for VBS. And if you want to donate too, here's how. Find what you want to donate, take the items off the board, put the money in the envelopes, and change. Open the lid, put them in. Don't forget those magnets. Right there. Twist, plop, plop, and Put it back, close the lid, easy. You see that? Super easy. And you know what? It's not just Pastor Devin that can be generous. All of us can be generous too. All right, everybody, remember, Tuesday, August 6th is going to be our next Burger King night. So starting in the afternoon all the way until 8 p.m., part of the proceeds is gonna be donated to missions so you can come on down here get your meal and also help support missions work around the world and it is gonna be fantastic so come on down here Tuesday August 6th all right remember for the next seven weeks we are playing a little game called where in the world is Kyle Beatty so you got to guess what location I'm at for the next seven weeks and at the end on the 25th of August during our church picnic you will receive a life-size prize if you're the one who can guess them all. So that's each week for the next seven weeks until August 25th at our church picnic. Remember that life-size prize can be yours. All right, remember, every single Wednesday night starting at 7, we've got our kids club. And also at 7 on Wednesday nights, we've got our adult Bible study. And we're talking about living one's faith. And it is incredible. You're going to want to check it out. So that's every single Wednesday at 7 p.m. Hope to see you there. All right, tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m., Ron Byers is giving his class Catalyst on Facebook Live. So you're going to want to tune in at 6.30 p.m. tomorrow night. For those of you who want to be real help, according to Jeremiah 22:16, on Saturday, July 20th, we're meeting down at Burger King at noon, and Pastor Devin is going to buy a select meal for those of us who help. And at 1 p.m., we're going to meet over at Liberty Street to do service, to be real help, and it is going to be awesome. It's the, one of the best ways to show the love of Christ through our actions. So that's Saturday, July 20th at noon at Burger King. Hope you guys can be a part of that. All right, remember the four things that God asked us to do this year, which are we're going to be sharing our faith with at least one person this year to be real help according to Jeremiah 22:16, 16, like I mentioned earlier. We're going to be reading through the major prophets of the Old Testament, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and also to be doing the Daniel fast one day a month. God bless. Those are the four things.
All right, the moment you've been waiting for has finally arrived. So get your pens out and get ready to take some notes because here he is, the one and the only Pastor Devin. We had our questions last week, and one question that we didn't answer last week that was on the list, but it wasn't one we were going to answer last week, was, you know, how, how do I know my gift is special? So this week in staff, I showed them about it, and it was like, wow, so I decided to use it as an illustration today. Everybody here has a Social Security number, right? What's the purpose of that number? Anybody know? What? Get benefits, identification, but identification for what reason and what reason only? So they can tax you. So you know who to tax. That's why you have it. You know, later in life, it's supposed to benefit you. Whether it'll be around 30 years from now, nobody knows. But it's designed to make sure they can count you and number you so they can get your money. Beautiful, isn't it? But there are, in a social security number, there are nine digits. Do you know why there are nine digits? It is so they have enough number, and they came up with this, they have enough numbers, they thought they would never run out of numbers. It gives them one billion combinations. Well, actually, 999 million. 999,999 because they don't use 0000000000. 000 000 000 000 000 000 000 000. Okay? And the reason they picked this number, a nine digit number, they thought the population never reached a billion. Well, India and China have already done that. You know, it could happen here, who knows what. But it's designed that everybody has a specific number so they're unique, so they can tax you uniquely. <laughs> Terrible, isn't it? Now, about the gifts of God, there are how many root gifts? 24 root gifts in the Bible. It doesn't mean they all look exactly the same. They could do different things. You could have combos of different gifts. You could have one gift, or you could be t have three gifts, or whatever. It, God, all the gifts are used for us to make up our unique talents that God has given us, and when we use them correctly, we will be happy in the Lord. And people say, how do I know mine is unique? Well, here's how you know, because if you take all 24 gifts, take 24 things, and find out all the combinations of 24 numbers, you get this number. One septillion, six hundred and eighty six sextillion, five hundred and fifty three quintillion, six hundred and fifteen quadrillion, nine hundred twenty seven tr trillion, nine hundred twenty two billion, three hundred fifty four million, one hundred eighty seven thousand, seven hundred forty five combinations. So until we get to about one point seven septillion people, there is a unique gifting for every single person. Isn't that awesome? God has something special for you. And we're going to start using, we start using people who are going to come to church because we're going to have all the gifts here. So if you haven't done it, you want to find out what is a unique thing. You, if you missed the series, you can go online to YouTube and see the whole series. Uh, and also we have a little, a little mini uh, version of it back there in the packet. It explains all the gifts there in a really short way. You can always come ask me. But we want you to be satisfied. We want to see God win, right? We want to see God move because we're not supposed to be losers. We're supposed to be what? Winners in the Lord because I have overcome the world. You can be victorious. Today, we're gonna, now we're going to go into our series for our next eight weeks. We're going to talk about who God is. You know, God is, is not a was not God or was God or soon to be God. He is. It says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and that's a long time. He's always the same. This verse tells you he's always the same. And then we get James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift. Hey, you know, we just talked about the gifts, right? is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. That means God never changes. He is never anything but what he says he is. And in the Bible, God calls himself, I am, which can be translated, he is. And people know that God is. The Bible exists to show us that God is not that was or is not, you know, what can he be, but what he is now in our lives is to reveal himself to us. So over the next eight weeks, we're going to look at every single book of the Bible. All right? And we're going to see who, what God is in there. You know, you ever wonder why God wrote the books? It's, it's to reveal who he was. Now, how many of you know every single book in the Bible? Oh, not everybody. Okay. All right. You know, it's a big book, right? But God, as we read it, we study it, we learn more and more about it. I read the Bible about every three to four months to read the whole Bible through. Why? Because, well, it's kind of, well, I'm a pastor. I better be reading it, right? If I don't know the whole Bible, that's a bad thing, right? You know, I, I, can, I have memorized entire books of the Bible. I have, uh, I know where every story is. If you know your story, I can tell you where it is and where to find it and, and hopefully what it's about. If I don't, I'll say I don't know and I'll go figure it out. Occasionally someone pops something like, where is that? And then I go look and it's not there and then I find out. But different things that go on. Because you know, people like to make things up too, don't they? They discredit Christianity. And, but the more I read it, the more I want to know more. 
We need to read this book because, you know, it explains who God is to us. How are we going to explain who God is to somebody else if we don't know who God is ourselves? You know, how many times do people guess at who God is? Well, I think God is like that. That's real authoritative, isn't it? How about you know what God is? And each week, if you want to collect bulletins, the next eight bulletins in the pastor's side, where I have a little side on the, on the pastor's reflections, I'm going to have, each week I'm going to have the book of the Bible we did the last week and what it was about. And so you can collect all eight. Make a trading cards, you know. Collect all eight and you'll have it all and you'll be able to put it together. So, or you can take notes while I'm talking. I prefer you take notes while I'm talking, but I'll have it in you every week. So I know it is the summer season. People will miss a few weeks, but it's an awesome series that God's going to do. And at the end, you'll be able to, anybody will be able to name a book to you and say, well, who's God in this book? And you'll be able to say, this is who God is. Won't that be great? Instead of guessing who he is. This is what God is explaining himself in this book. For lack of a better term, the next eight weeks will be kind of like vacation Bible school for adults. And you're going to get a little primer on every single book so you can be able to show people who God is and how he is relevant today. Because that's what people ask, where is God today? Is he still relevant? He better be, right? So here we go. We're going to start today in Genesis. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So in Genesis, he is the breath of life. Now, this is one of five times God talks about the breath of life. Now, what kind of life? He's not, when he breathed the breath of life into man, he's not talking about the animals and and plants and things like that. He's talking about his unique breath of life that enables us to be able to think, to know, to make choices, to reason, and to know and love God. In order for us to have what? Relationships with one another and relationships with who? God. He wants us to have a relationship with him where we can make choices. The breath of life is our greatest gift because without the breath of life, we'd just be like a robot. It gives us a chance to have this relationship. It also gives chance, God a chance to have a relationship with us by giving us the freedom to choose and think. And this breath of life also gives us eternal life. The only question is where will you end up? It's your choice where you end up. What will one do with the breath of life God gave them? God gave you uniquely his life, every essence, inside of you. You were made in the image of God with the breath of life. Will you choose to love God and submit to him freely? That's the key. Giving yourself over to God freely, not because you have to. Some people come to become Christians because they think they became a Christian because they they were forced into it. If you were forced into it, you probably didn't become a Christian. Because God wants you to freely give. It's your choice. And then what happens? He comes to your life and blesses you. Or you can choose not to have that relationship and not be with him. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He just gives them their choice as he loves them so very much. And on that note, you never can take the breath of life for granted. Don't take your breath of life for granted. You have unique gifts. No one has the gifts you have. God has something special for you. God has a plan, a purpose for you. He loves you, and he made you to do something great, not something mediocre. Now, what is greatness? It's not as the world sees, but as God sees Get to heaven one day, just because you, maybe you taught a cl- Sunday school class for kids for 20 years, you thought you didn't do anything great, you get to heaven, you see how those kids went out and told other people about Jesus, and millions of people came to know Jesus because of your class. Wow, that's something great. God has our gifts. Remember, there's no important or less important gifts, no big or little miracles, just stuff that God does. And also by that, don't take anyone else's life, breath of life for granted either. Uh, they deserve what they got. They have the breath of life in them as well. God wants them to come to him. Never look at someone else and disdain them just because of what they've done because you've done those things too. They, every human being has the breath of life in them from God for the sole purpose of giving you the opportunity to have a relationship with God. Don't take yours for granted and don't take someone else's for granted. You know, you see that all the time in our world today. You look at the news, look at politics, look at how people treat each other on the streets. You know what? I, I remember, uh, who remembers the movie Crocodile Dundee? All right, most of you do. Okay, you haven't seen it? Look it up. But uh, they, they t- he, he's, in, he's in the Australian outback, and, and she takes him to New York. And he gets to New York, and, and at the time, he said, 8 million people live there. He said, New York must be the happiest place on earth because 8 million people live right close to each other. Have you been to New York? I've been there this summer. Actually, it's not that bad. 
Are they rude? Yes, but it's just how they are to one another, you know? But you know what? You know what? But there's a lot of nice people. They, they get, it's interesting. You know, God wants us all to look on each other with the same love that he looked on us with. Amen? Amen. So we continue along. On that note, since he gave us life, then we come to Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. For I will pass through the land of Egypt, and on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when you see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So in Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb. Now that God gave us the breath of life, he also knew that we would mess it up. We would sin. We would make mistakes. He knew that ahead of time. Because he knew he gave us a choice. And you know, when you have a choice, there's a choice for the opposite. And he knew we wouldn't live us as standards. So in the second book, he, he gives us this illustration of the exodus of the, of the, of the Jews from Egypt. And where what happens is the last plague, he says, take a lamb and break it. Kind of how he was broken when he came to earth and they whipped him and didn't put the crown of thorns in it. He says, and take it and take the blood and spread it over the doorpost of the house. And when the angel comes by at night and sees the blood on the door, he will what? Pass over you from death and allow you to what? Live. The interesting thing on the doorpost, you have three parts of the doorpost. And what the doorpost signified that when you put the blood on all three sides, you are protecting everything that dwelt within. And God, when he says, you know, when you apply the blood of Jesus to your life, he cleanses all that is within you. When you sin, you're supposed to die. But no, you don't die right away. But God gives you a chance to repent. He gives you until the day you die to do that. But when you do, the blood comes down and cleanses every single thing. God doesn't miss a thing when you ask him to cleanse you. Isn't that great? So you can pass over from what? From life to death. But that's the key about Christianity is that the blood was over all three. It wasn't just over the top of the door. It was on all sides of the door because God wanted to say that everything was given over to him. If you want to have God's blessings in your life, you have to give everything over to him. Not just what you want to give over to him. That's the fallacy about most people who think they're a Christian today. Well, I, I give this part of my life to God and I keep this part. No, no, that's not how it works. It's God, it's all yours. Let me do what you want you to do. And then God gives you what? He says, he gives you the desires of your heart. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? No matter what you are, what you are, no matter who you are or what you've done, God doesn't care. All he cares is you say, God, forgive me. And he says, I want to forgive you because I want to spend eternity with you. I made you and I want to be with you. Don't you want to be with somebody who wants you? Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we want? We want to be with somebody who wants you, right? Amen? Now we go on to Leviticus. Maybe. Yes, there we go. Leviticus 21.10, For he who is a high priest among his brethren, <clears throat> on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and who is consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor tear his clothes. So in Leviticus, Jesus is our high priest, our great high priest. So the high priest, let's talk about what a high priest did, because a lot of people hear about the high priest. What, does he, what was his purpose? There were priests, and then there was the high priest. Well, first of all, the high priest says he never uncovers his head, he never tears his clothes. Well, if you read through the Bible, when someone covered their head, uncovered their head, they did it because they were ashamed of what the people they were in charge of did. And whenever they would tear their clothes, whenever someone did something wrong, they would tear their clothes in disgust because they were upset with what had happened. It drove them to go bonkers. Today it would be like us pulling our hair out. You know, you heard that expression. Or shunning them or things like that. He might think, shunning is not just an Amish thing. People do it all the time. I'm not going to talk to that person because of what they did. God never does, said that for us, did he? But he says that he will never uncover his head and he will never tear his clothes. That means God is never, ever, ever too ashamed of you. Isn't that great? He only loves you. Yes, can he get disappointed? Absolutely. 
But he's never ashamed that he made you. He is never regretful that he made you. Isn't that great? Even when you've been the dirtiest, rottenest person you've ever been, God still is not ashamed of making you. Isn't that wonderful? So what else does the high priest do? His job is to oversee the responsibilities of all the subordinate priests. Now, if you're a Christian, it says that you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you are the priests of that temple. So God is watching over you now because you're one of his subordinate priests. Isn't that great? Now people say, well, God's watching over me like big brother, so I do something wrong, he's ready to pounce. No, God watches over you not to tell you you're doing something wrong, but to help you have the best life you possibly can be. Now sometimes he has to encourage you to stop doing something because he knows it's going to lead you to destruction. But he wants to encourage you to be the best. He watches over you, not to put his thumb on you, but to liberate you so you can have an amazingly blessed life. You don't have to worry about anything. God will take care of all of your needs, all the verses he promises you can have. He wants to give to you, and he's watching over you, waiting to do that for you. Next thing, only the high priest, they would come to the high priest in order to determine truth, And what was false? The people would go to the high priest. Not the other priest, but to the high priest. He would consult with the Urim and the Thummim and these things, if you read through the Old Testament. But when they were not sure, they would go to the high priest. And we can, and here's the thing, Jesus is our high priest. And he says in Hebrews chapter 4, we can go to his throne boldly whenever we want and ask him whatever we want. If you're not sure of something, all you got to do is go to him. And he is required as being a high priest to tell you what's true and what's not. He will show you the right way and the wrong way. And what is the wrong way you're going? Here's the key, though. You need to ask him first. Don't start going your own way and then ask God, I'm going the right way. Right, God? Yeah, huh? God? No, don't. that's not the way it works. Because once you start going in a certain direction, it's kind of hard to tell us not to do what we're doing, isn't it? Once we start going, God, see, I'm doing this. I know I'm doing right, so you need to fix it. And then God doesn't fix what we're doing because we just know we're right, but we, don't, we didn't ask God at the beginning whether he wants to do that or not. Ask God first if this is the right or wrong. You know, today we got a lot of fake stuff in the world today, right? People trying to tell this and that. If you don't understand, ask God, and what happened? He will what? Speak to you. He will let you know what's true and what's not. And the last and most important duty of the high priest was to conduct the service on the Day of Atonement. Only he was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, behind the veil, stand before God, and make a sacrifice for himself and for the people. And he brought the blood into the Holy of Holies, sprinkled on the mercy seats, God's throne. Jesus right now stands in the Holy of Holies. He's in the presence of God. It says in the Bible that he is there interceding for you. Why? Because we still make mistakes. And God says when we sin, the wages of sin are death. But Jesus stands there in between you and God and pleads for you to give you time to repent and come to him. And the great thing is you don't have to wait for a day of atonement to come to know God. You can do it any day of the week, any hour of the day, every minute of the day. And he's there saying, God, I'm pleading. And when we sin, he is the one standing between us and God giving us that chance because he already made the sacrifice once and for all. As we talked about communion earlier, the sacrifice is still alive and well today. The blood is still oozing through his veins, having the power to forgive now, then, and forevermore. He does the ultimate duty of the high priest for us. See, the high priest's job was to take this, all the sins on himself and on this, on this scapegoat we learned uh, at Easter this year. Brother Mike told us about that. You know, Jesus said, I'll just take him from you. All you got to do is give him to me. That's the key, though. you got to let the high priest do his job. Sometimes we wonder why God doesn't take things from us. I'll tell you why he doesn't take things from me. He will never take anything from you. You have to give it to him. And then he takes it. He will not force it on you. But when you're ready to give it to him, he will take it away from you. Next one is numbers. So it was always, the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. I like the word, so it was Always. It's a never ending word. So, in Numbers, Jesus is the fire by night. The Israelites lived in a day, get this, where there were no cell phones, there was no GPS, there was no ask.com, there was no, hey Google! 
And it's hard for us to believe in that. You know, about 30 years ago, that's, some of that stuff didn't exist. Today, we almost don't know how we can live without it. Without Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter, what would we do? But these lights were wandering around in the desert with very little landmarks and none of the, anything to guide them with. And they had a long way to go, and at night it got pretty dark. And apparently the wilderness is just like Pennsylvania. I'll tell you why. I lived 15 years in Texas and Florida, and it didn't matter where you went. You could be in the middle of nowhere, and everywhere there was a streetlight. In Pennsylvania, you don't got any. I don't know how you guys don't run into each other. I mean, you're in Texas and Florida, the roads go this way and that way. You can play tic-tac-toe. Here, you got roads with blind corners all over the place. You got no streetlights. I'm amazed at how we don't run into each other out here. I remember the first time I drove out here, we were like, yeah, it's only 19 miles to get here. We'll get here in about 20 minutes. Oh, 119 is no straight road. <laughs> Took me almost 25 minutes, 30 minutes to get here. I thought I was going to be late for my interview because I had no idea. I come from the south. Things are straight. We just went on a missions trip, and literally, you could, you, could, you could tie a rope on the wheel and close your eyes and wake up three hours later and be on the same road. It was amazing. We went, you know, just, it's just everything was 100% straight. Oh, in South Carolina, and South Dakota has street lights. Not an in Indian reservation, but the other places it does. But you know what? You know, we need light to guide us. This world is filled with darkness all around us. And not just literal darkness, but the darkness of gloom and depression and doubt and worry and fear. You know why? Because the devil wants to scare us. Think us that God's not working today. But when you come to Jesus, it says he shines in the darkness for you. He is there to guide you. You know, he, he's the fire of night today. He is because you know what? He wants to guide you. He wants to light your way. He wants to show you where to go and how to get there. He also wants you to know that you will be safe. You don't have to wander around in the dark and wonder where you're going. A lot of people wander around. They have no idea where they're going with the Lord. It's like, hey, ask God to guide you. One of the reasons you need your, your prayer language is that helps light the way. It also shows us that, you know what? You're going to be okay. Because you know what? You see the dark road and it's all dark, but you see that glimmer of light. God shows you the light. He doesn't show you everything because you'd be scared if you saw it all. He says, guess what? I'm going to get you to the right place. Don't worry about what's happening. And I'm keeping you in the dark in some place so you don't see the stuff on the side or on the left because I'm protecting you from that. You don't need to see that. I'm guiding you. It's going to be okay. And lastly, remember that song earlier, Fear Can't Stand? He wants you to know he wants to push all fear away. He wants you to know you don't have to be afraid of anything whatsoever. But yet as humans we are. We, we live in a world that's dark and fallen. But what God says, he says, where? He says, look up at the light. And the key is to look up. Because if you look down, what are you doing? You're trusting yourself. I look down a lot when I get close to the edge of the stage because I've fallen off it already. <laughs> but you know what? God says, look up at the light because the light shines down in the darkness and chases everything away. When the light's directly overhead, there's no shadow. He chases it all away. The darkness cannot live in the light, so go towards the light. If you see the light, hey, guess what? The bad stuff's not there because it can't be there. Now, what does God mean by look up? You need to have your heart, your mind, your thoughts focused on him, not on yourself. See, if you look down, you're focused on yourself. What can I do? And he says, God, hey, I want to go beyond me. And you're following the Lord. What happens though, sometimes people look at themselves, try to fix it themselves, and then they look up. And God shows up, and God wonders, what if you just looked up first into the light and asked me? And when you do that, he loves you so very much, and he'll be there for you. And not only will he show you where to go, he'll do this too. Deuteronomy 5.1, And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. In Deuteronomy, Jesus is Moses' voice. This is repeated over and over again. Moses spoke and said, God wants you to know that he wants to speak with you. Why? Because he wants you to know he's real. And he'll speak many different ways. 
Sometimes with the still, small voice. But you know what? People, I think, cop out with that. I'm just waiting for the still, small voice. You know what? God wants to speak with you dynamically. He says he can speak to you through dreams, through visions. In Acts chapter 2, he says he'll even speak with you out loud, just like he did the people in the Bible. He also can speak with you ver- non-verbally. He can hold you. The touch of God is real. I've experienced all these things that I've just mentioned to you because God wants you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, he is real. But the question is, people ask, how, people ask this question here. Thank you. Someone's paying attention. Yes. How do you, people ask me that all the time. How do you hear God's voice? That's a good question to answer, right? Well, here we're going to go. One I've mentioned a few weeks ago. I'm not going to spend too much time. I'm done with the other two. First one is this. Don't say amen too quick. Now, I said it a few weeks ago, if you weren't missing it, here's the Cliff Notes version. We pray, la, la, blah, Lord, thank you for this. I want this, blah, blah, blah. Amen. What happens if you say amen? You stop the communication. You cannot hear God if you're not what? Listening. As soon as you say amen, you're stopped listening. If you come to me and say, Pastor, that's not the case, I'm, okay, I, but I, if you really think about it, once you say amen, you walk away, you pretty much are done, aren't you? So don't do it too quickly. Now, if you're one of those who say amen and still want to talk, that's great. But most people aren't like that to say amen, they do. So if you want to hear God's voice, stop saying amen right away. Because then you have no reason why you, I haven't heard God's voice. Well, if you don't give him a chance to talk, he ain't going to. Second of all, talk more, ask less. Let's do that one more time. Talk more, ask less. The word prayer means what? Talking with God, not to God. Talking with God. He wants you to talk more about your life, what's going on. You know, most people have prayer, what? Ask God for this, 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 this. God says we're allowed to come with them a request, but he wants us. Prayer does not mean ask. Prayer means talk with God. You know, we all love to talk to somebody about something. We, we have the wonderful ability. We, we have to, hey, during our five-minute walk around shaking hands, it takes me forever to get you to sit back down. Why? Because you're what? Talking with somebody. And it's fun, isn't it? God wants that to be the same with your relationship with him. But here's what he needs. He needs you to not ask so much, but talk more. Don't, don't stop asking, but talk more than you ask. If you have a lot to ask for, spend some time talking too. And when you talk with someone, you also got to pause and let them what? Talk back to you. And you know what? God may ask you something too. You know the reason why a lot of people say amen real quick? They don't want God to ask them to do anything. Isn't it amazing? We want to ask God everything, but no, God, don't ask me nothing. You know what? The interesting thing is God, will, God, God rarely asks a whole lot of us. He says, I'm the one that's going to make you do what you need to do. I'm going to give you all you need. Usually he only asks you to do one thing here and there because you know what? That's the relationship we have. He's there to provide for you. But what he wants more than anything else is to talk. He's okay with asking, but if you ask somebody something over and over again, it gets... You don't want to meet with that person anymore, do you? Because all I do is ask you for something. Oh, no, here they come. What do they want now? You know, God's like us. We're made in the image of God. He craves communication with us. Prayer is not, Lord, help me with this, help me with that, help me with this, and fix this. Amen. That's not prayer. That's called begging. Ouch. You're allowed to ask your best friend whatever you want, but your best friend would rather have a conversation with you. How about in your conversation, you talk about what's going on and then let him decide what he's going to do about it. Wouldn't that be better? Ever talk to somebody, I have this going on in life, and all of a sudden they do something to help you out? Why'd you do that? Well, I heard about that when you're talking. I just felt I wanted to do that for you because I love you. You know what? God wants you. If you want to hear the voice of God, you've got to actually decide to talk more, ask less. And then the last one is, now it's not like the first one, don't be in a hurry to hang up on God. Now it's not, t- not talking about saying amen, I'm talking about don't be in a hurry to say, I, well, I don't have time to talk to God today. Well, you, God, I'm so busy, I got this going on. You need to decide to make time for God if you want to hear from God. Because you know what? God says, I respond as you respond. 
So therefore, the effort you put in is the effort that he will respond in kind to. If God's on the back burner, don't expect God to speak into your life on a regular basis because you're not making him important. You're in the driver's seat in this conversation. They say, but I'm too busy today. Well, okay, well, you, you, you're too busy to talk to the almighty creator God who wants to bless your life? That kind of sounded crazy to me, doesn't it? But you don't, know what, you don't know what got going on. You know what God does? You know what? God, time and space means nothing to God. He can make five seconds feel like five hours. I mean, he stopped the sun and the moon. He made the sun go back 10 degrees for Hezekiah. He can do whatever he wants. He's God, because if he can't do whatever he wants, he's not God. And so if you give him time and say, and God knows your schedule, you don't have to tell him. But if you make time for him and say, God, I've got a busy day today, God can make that time feel like an amazing moment in time. He can stop time for you. He's done that for me. I say, God, I need this, and he does it. Why? Because I have a relationship with him. I talk with him. He wants to talk with you, but you got to make time for God. Just like we made time here to shake hands. You're going to go to lunch, right? You're going to have a conversation at lunch. Ever thought about maybe at the lunch table or the dinner table, instead of talking to everybody else, how about talk to God with the family? I haven't done that. Just came to my head. No, why not include him in the dinner conversation? What if he showed up at the dinner table with all of you? You might say, that's crazy, it's ridiculous. Well, don't knock it till you try it. I might be trying it. Not today because my kids are going on a youth trip today, but we, we might try that one time. Worst thing he does, he doesn't show up, right? But what if he does? Because here's the deal. When you don't, because when you don't, when you're in a hurry and you don't, and you say amen too quickly, you ask, you don't talk to him, here's what you're doing. You are limit, you stop limiting time with God. You only limit what God wants to share with you and for you. When you put God on the back burner and don't, have a, and don't make a priority to have a daily conversation with him, you are not limiting God. You are limiting what God can do for you. So if you come to me, I don't hear God like you do. I'll tell you why. Because I put a priority on hearing God. I come in here, I read my Bible, then I come up here, I put my knees down, say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? And then I listen to God for a little bit. Sometimes I'm in here for 10 minutes, sometimes I'm in here for an hour. And there's days, sometimes I go, I'm too busy. And then you know what God does? He convicts me. I have to come back over in the middle of the night. My wife, why are you going over to church? I got to do something. What I'm doing is I, I didn't prioritize that. I'm pastor. I make mistakes. We all will. But we need to prioritize time with the Lord if you want to hear from him. If you don't want to hear God, then don't make a priority with him. But if you want to hear the voice of God, not just the still small voice, not just the, oh, I feel something, but the actual audible voice of the Lord. You want to feel the actual hug of the Lord, the touch of God. It's real simple. You have to make it what? A priority. And why does God allow this? Why does he want to talk to us? Because we're going to be afraid. He wants to calm you. You're going to have questions. He wants to give you the answers right from the horse's mouth. Rather than you trying to figure out from some other point of view. He'll have, you'll have a situation in your life and he'll have the right words to tell you how to deal with that situation. When you're happy, he's going to be the rejoicing. He's going to make you even more happier than you already are yourself. You ever get with friends and you're happy and they just make you and they celebrate with you? Imagine when God celebrates with you, how happy he can make you feel. And he'll also be able to guide you more because you hear the voice of God. You don't have to question whether you're doing the right thing or not. Because there'll be many times that people say, well, that's not right. We don't believe that. But you know what, when you know that God told you that you know that you know, you don't have to worry about what anybody else says because you're one with God. And that's why God wants that for you today. And he is still that voice today, and he wants, to listen. he wants to listen to you, and he wants to talk to you, and he wants to help you. It brings us to Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. God says we are free. It says in Joshua that God is, says that we have salvation's choice. God gives you the choice to follow him or not. No strings attached. You know, in this passage here, Joshua is kind of upset with the elders because they're deciding on how to govern their land now that Joshua's about to die. And Joshua says it's real simple. God told 
He gave you his laws. Follow them. He says, you will be blessed. Read Deuteronomy 28. It's amazing. This is what you'll be blessed by. This is what you'll be cursed by. I read do the blessings. And he put it in writing. So if you do it, he has to what? Do what he said. It's a contract. And it's our choice. And what would happen is they were deciding who they were going to serve. And they had seen all the Israel, all these leaders had seen what Moses had done, what Joshua had done, the victories God had given them, the parting of the Red Sea, the parting of the Jordan River, Jer all these things they saw, but they still hadn't made up their mind whether or not they were going to serve the Lord. And this is why miracles don't save people. You can have all the miracles. That's why the gifts. There's a gift of miracles, right? There's gifts of healings. But that's how someone gets saved. They won't stay saved because here's the deal. They fade away. Life still happens. That's why you need all the other gifts of mercy and compassion and, and serving and why you need discipleship so you know God wants to take care of all of your needs. Because once the healing's over and something else happens, you forget about what God did. That's what happened with the Israelites under Joshua. But Joshua said, here you go. I will serve the Lord whether you will or not. And he hopes that they will do it. God hopes that we will choose to follow him. He has gone out of his way to prove that he loves you. What has he done for me lately? Well, you're here, right? Sun still moves. We still spin around. Climate's here. Food still produces. we still got water. You have the breath of life. But not only that, he, he died on the cross. No other ancient manuscript is like the New Testament. It has so many proofs text to it. Over 5,000, I think 800 copies of any ancient book. He did what he did for you because he loved you. And he didn't have to do any of that, but he wanted to tell you, I did this for you, and you still, though, have your choice and your choice alone. And that brings us to the last book today. Judges 2.11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. This is a Baal means any other God besides God. And, uh, and for the next few verses, it talks about how uh, right after Joshua dies, they go ahead and do their own evil stuff, did this, did that. And it talks about how they, they went after these other gods. But you know what? God still loves us. And I like this next word in this verse. Nevertheless. Aren't you glad God uses words like that? The Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hands of those who plundered him. Now the job of the judge was not just to deliver them. But the job of the judge was to be the lawgiver. To bring them back to the law of God so they could be what? Blessed. God gave us his law not to show us what sin was or to show us uh, how bad we were. He gave us the law to show us how you can have the best life possible. You know, the world makes fun about God's laws and the world suffers greatly. And many times Christians do too. But why do they? Well, here's the difference. God's laws are a contract. He says, if you follow these, you will be blessed. And he gives 5,400 promises to that effect. If you do this, I will do this. And the laws are designed to show us how we can be blessed. They're not designed to tell us what we can and cannot do. Because they're a choice for us. We don't have to follow them. We don't want to. We have free will, Right? But some people call themselves Christians are afflicted in life. And why is that? Because here's why. I'll tell you why. It's like we talked about on Wednesday. If you want to come to a great Wednesday night class, living one's faith is great. Talked about Wednesday night about if one is guilty in one part of the law, they're guilty in all of the law. What God is trying, what we've got to understand is, you know, you can't pick and choose what you're going to follow. If God says this is right and this is wrong, guess what? This is right and this is wrong. God says, you know, he says, you know, the Ten Commandments, he has them all, right? But some religions, like we talked a few weeks ago, they got rid of number two, right? You should not have an idol. How can you call yourself a Christian religion and take away commandment number two? Because they like idols. You know, or hey, I, I, I like this, this, and this, but this interferes with how I want to live my life, so I'm going to just ignore that law. Well, I'm not going to give to God because, you know, I, I know we're supposed to do that, but I, I need this. And, well, you, that means you're not trusting God. 
Or God, well, I, I really like the situation I'm living in, but I know this is not supposed I'm supposed to be doing. What's well, your choice, right? But then you come to me and wonder why you're not blessed. I'll tell you why you're not blessed. You can't keep some, but not all of it. Now you might say, but pastor, I don't know all the law. That's okay. That's why there's James 4, 17. For them to know to do good and don't do it, it is sin. Your education with God is a lifelong journey. Some people will be at different places. That's why you also cannot look on somebody else with partiality. We talked about Wednesday night. Because what is, what is to you might not be to somebody else because they're just learning. In Christianity, we have a tendency to jump on people who aren't like us. Why would you do that? We're all unique. Our job is to encourage one another, not discourage one another. But you know what? As you get close to the Lord and you read what He wants you to do, you know what? As you learn something new, guess what? Your relationship goes to another level. And guess what? More is expected out of you. But when more is expected out of you, more God can give you. See, because when you're a baby Christian, He can only give you so much because you can only handle so much. But as you grow in the Lord, you can handle more and you can have more, but also you have to follow God's laws. You know, in the fall, we're going to do a, a series on the Ten Commandments and how relevant they are to our lives today. You're going to really enjoy that. But they're all summed up in Mark 12, 30 and 31. It says this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. This is the first commandment. And the second commandment is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, why, do we, why are we supposed to follow God's laws? Not because we have to, not because we're forced to, because this is how we show God love. You know, what, what, what do you want? You want to know how to show someone love. It says, follow the commandments of God God says, and that's how you show you love me, by doing what I ask. So we follow the commandments, not only to be blessed, but first of all, to show that we really love him, and we really trust him. And then love your neighbors yourself. In James, it's called the royal law. It means the king of all laws. <clears throat> but here's the thing. If you love your neighbors yourself, you'll follow everything else pretty good. <clears throat> it's simple, yet so very hard. But here's the deal about it. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. That means anybody in your sphere of influence is your neighbor. It's not the person at the grocery store or down the hall. It's whoever is in your sphere of influence because that's who you connect with. And you need to love them as you love yourself. And here's the thing about this commandment. If you look at someone and say, I can't love them because of what they've done, then you can't serve God. Because God loved you when you were doing that thing too. And He came and saved you, right? Now, it doesn't mean you accept what they do. You know, love the people, hate the sin. But how you show it is key. Is the right way and the wrong. We've already done that before. We're supposed to help people get better, not push them down. They will never get better if you push them down. You need to help them get better. But we cannot say, well, I, I, I know what they did. I'm just never going to associate. I'm not going to love. What if Jesus did that to you? Because there was a point in time where you did stuff that God said, I would never want to associate with it. But you know what? He said, nevertheless, I will keep sending people to you. And it happens in churches. Like you have these church splits and church feuds and things like that. The church is not immune to that. Why? Because they don't practice this commandment. Love your neighbor as... Will you have problems? Yes. That's why Matthew 18 exists. Go to the person first. Don't tell everybody first, right? Remember? We like to tell everybody first, though. It's wrong. That's sin. <clears throat> But when you do that, what are you doing? When you follow the laws of God, you're showing God that you love Him. You know, I'm not immune. I have people that don't like me. That's okay. You know, I still love them anyways. I see them. I put a smile on. And there's times I go in the room and I'll see somebody there. Or I'll see somebody and I'll be like, man, I really don't want to go up and greet them. Because you know, they really did some really horrible things to me. But you know what? Every time I go up to them, I smile at them. I tell them I love them. I tell them they're awesome. Doesn't mean I condone what they did. But you know what? If I don't love them, I have no chance to ever change them. Because most of the time they know that I, they, they don't want to talk to me either because they know what they've done. But when I come up and say I love you just because, that breaks down a lot of barriers. But it takes someone to do it. You know, you know who it takes to do it? If you're the one who's offended, you're the one that needs to reach out in love. Because here's the deal. If you're waiting for them to come to you, you're going to be waiting a long, 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 long time. Because it's not human nature. But when you reach out, here's what happens. You honor God. You know what? I follow God's laws, not because I have to, but I follow them eagerly, and I want to do them. 
Do I make mistakes? Yes, and I have to come and repent. But I do it. You know why? Because I want God to know how much I love him. And when I do that, that's when he talks to me. He comes down, he grabs me. He, he, he does things for me. He moves mountains out of my way. Why? Because he then wants to show love back to me. I'm blessed. Not be, I don't fall to be blessed. I get blessed because I follow him and I love him. So that's where a lot of people get it wrong. They, they people say, well, do this and God will do this. No, no. Do this because you want to love him. And the blessings will become from it. If you do it to get blessed, you're not really doing it because you love them in the first place, are you? You're doing it to what? Get something. So what are you doing? You're using God then. Do you like to be used? Oh, I can get a lot of amens there, huh? Do you think God likes to be used? Reach out in love and see how he reach back to you. So in conclusion today, he is... And what is he today? He is the breath of life. Don't ever take your breath of life for granted. You are unique, you are special, and don't take anybody else's breath of life for granted. You're in their life for a reason. Number two, God cared so much about that breath of life that he came so you could pass over from death to eternal life. No matter what you've done, he doesn't care what you've done. He just cares that you get rid of it so you can live with him forever. And he's your high priest watching over you. Letting you know what's right from wrong, and he's never, ever, ever ashamed of you. He loves you so very much. And he's the fire by night. This is a dark world. And we need someone to guide us in a remarkable way. And here's the neat thing. When God guides you in this remarkable way, just like in the Old Testament when the fire showed up, they were wowed by it. It might not wow us today, but God leads in different ways, the light he leads. And when he does things in amazing ways, he'll make other people take a look notice and go, Wow. Because you know what? God wants to do it in an amazing way that not only brings you closer to him, but brings others around you closer to him. And when he's guiding us, he not only guides us, but he'll talk to us. He's Moses' voice. He wants to speak to you so you not only can see where to go, but he can tell you what you're supposed to do. And then he's salvation's choice. He does all the above for us to prove his love for us so we can make the choice. To come to know him. And when we do that, he is the lawgiver, not to tell us what we can and can't do, but to show us how we can show love back to him. And when we do that, how he can then shower us with blessings beyond our wildest imaginations because of the love we show him. He is that and more. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight's message. And I hope you learned a few things about who God is today and how he wants to be active in your life and do the amazing things for you each and every day of your life. And if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, would you please consider giving a donation so we can continue producing shows like this? You can give in two ways. You can go to our website and click on the donation button, and it's mbchurchpunksy.com, or you can go to newbeginningschurchpunksy.generous.org. We would really appreciate it. I'll come back next week as we continue our series, He Is. Have a great week, and remember that Jesus loves you, I love you, and you are awesome.